Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. Want to give a, a big shout out to my man, Rob Koifman, for being the first official sponsor. Our sponsorship terms are coming to a conclusion or an end, and it's a brand that I'm super happy that I partnered with. He's a great dude. I do believe that Koifin is a great product that people should try. In case you don't know, it's one of the fastest growing platforms for financial data and analytics to research stocks and understand market trends. Imagine a Bloomberg light with tons of high quality fundamental data and a powerful graph engine that can show it all clearly and a user interface that doesn't look like it was built in the 1990s. Y'all should check it out. Sign up for free at koifin.com. That's K-O-Y-F-I-N.com. Again, thank you to Rob. This particular episode is not necessarily sponsored by them, but it's actually kind of brought to you by myself, Elliot Turner, Josh Tarasoff, and Trey Cuppen. This episode features a young woman named Alex Blumenfeld, and she is somebody who I think is a very unique individual. She is 20 years old. She's at Vanderbilt University. She has founded a research service that sends surveys to college students, you know, Gen Z. I believe that she says in this episode that it covers 150 colleges now. And if you are interested in how people are interacting with an app, or I was interested in whether or not her peers were open to the idea of nicotine pouches versus being completely closed off to nicotine and or how they perceived nicotine pouches relative to cigarettes, right? So we sent out this survey and I got the results back. What I can tell you is when I talked to Trey about Alex, he said, there's a strong chance we're all going to be working for her one day. And I've never recommended her to anybody who hasn't enjoyed talking to her. I separately talked to Elliot and Josh about her. Both of them have used the service. Both of them speak very highly of her. And I hope that you listen to this episode and it resonates. And I hope that you understand potentially why reaching out to her and using her service makes sense. I don't want to quote the price that I paid for my survey because I don't know what her actual list price are and whether or not I paid it. So I'm just going to say I'm super happy with what I did with her. I'm super happy with the results and I was happy with the amount that it cost. I thought it was very reasonable. Rather than rambling, I'm going to let y'all listen. I, I would just, again, really encourage you to, to reach out to her. Red Rover is the name of her company. I'm going to drop her contact information in the show notes, and I hope y'all enjoy the episode. So Alex, how you doing today? I am doing very well. How are you, Bill? I am excited. I uh, am on my second podcast recording of the day. And uh yeah, well, I've decided to wet my palate with a little bit of uh, wine, and I look <laughs> forward to speaking to you. Wonderful. Same here. So people are going to say, who is Alex uh, Blumenfeld? And I'm going to say to them, someone that comes highly recommended by <laughs> Elliot Turner, Josh Tarasoff, and Trey Cuppen. And if you know those three people, then I think that that should be hook enough and if you don't know those people, we will uh, provide quality entertainment and people can figure out why uh, down the road. So Alex, do uh, you want to tell people a little bit about yourself? So I am a junior at Vanderbilt, currently studying HOD, which is human and organizational development. And I'm also the founder of a survey company called Red Rover. Um, and this all sort of started because I was interning at a um, concentrated long only fund this past summer called Greenbrier Partners. And I was conducting some qualitative anecdotal research for, for them. And part of what I was doing that seemed most valuable to them was conducting some surveys on the side where I was just asking my friends what they thought of certain products and, and services that Gen Z, which is my generation, use a lot. And, um, 
my boss and the portfolio manager, Trey and Shad, were really shocked at, A, how quickly the results were coming back from these little polls that I was running. Um, and B, the kids were really excited to answer them and they weren't even getting paid. So that was sort of how this started. One it's day, a good business, yeah. Alex. <laughs> Get, getting content and not paying for content is a good business. And charging yes. a lot for a survey. Not that you do. <laughs> I'm just saying that would be a good business. It, it would be if I could find more people that uh, didn't want to be paid. But unfortunately, once you get out past uh, your close friends, they mm. do want a few cents. That stinks. Have you considered <laughs> uh, paying in Bush Light? I, you know, we talked about Bush Light and pizza uh, as an alternative to Venmos. But it turns out Venmos are a little bit more motivating. But yeah. who knows? Maybe we'll we'll do a combo in the future. Yeah, I think uh, as long as you're focused on the college crowd, Bush Light and pizza should always be in your back pocket. <laughs> they're they're commonplace here at, on campuses. Indeed. Well, I uh, I lived some of that commonplace uh, almost two decades ago, which is sad to say out loud, but it's also true. Um, for people that may not know, I have used Alex, uh, well, not Alex, but Red Rover, and we did a survey on tobacco. So your, well, nicotine pouches specifically is what our survey was on. But do you have a specialty? I would say that the the value that we bring is this expertise that Gen Z has in the tech and the consumer space. Because Gen Z is the first generation that are truly considered tech natives. So we actually are the first generation to have grown up with technology. These are the kids that grew up using iPhones and iPads when they were toddlers, when they were in middle school. And because of that, they have a very unique perspective on a lot of the tech companies that are publicly traded today. And part of that expertise means that they're very picky. So if you can get this demographic right, then you can get a lot of other demographics right. But it also just means that these are the, the primary users for a lot of these companies and their, their opinions are really valuable for that reason. But on the consumer side, this generation is soon to be the largest generation of consumers. Right now, they make up 40% of the consumption in the US and they're only growing. So as they get older and you know get jobs and become more successful and have you know means to spend money, they will continue to grow. But that's why people are really interested in what they have to say when it comes to consumer brands and also tech companies. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you um, mind talking a little bit about the context in which, uh, like how Red Rover started and what Trey was looking to, to accomplish? Because I know he looks at the world through sort of a win-win-win lens uh, and I'm just kind of curious to hear you talk a little bit about your experience at Greenbrier and also how your service uh, added value to them and spawned into, you know, wherever it's going to go in the future. Totally. Well, so we really just started out doing a few small surveys with um, a few girls in my sorority, actually. We had a group chat with about 50 kids in my sorority, and they said, I want to know if uh, these kids know what an app called Zen is. Not the nicotine pouch, ironically, but... Um, it was an app that was similar to TikTok, but they paid you. And I said, I've never heard of it, but I'll, I'll run a, a survey just with my friends and see if anybody else is, has heard of it. And the results came back, um, unsurprisingly, that no one had heard of or used the app. But Trey was curious about it because it was, I think it was close to number one most downloaded on the app store that week. And he hmm. thought, oh, like maybe this is the, the next big TikTok. And um, sure enough, within about two weeks, it was off of the, the App Store top, top charts list and um, never to be seen again. But I think that is when he first recognized the value in asking the consumers of these products uh, if they use them and why they don't. But I was able to write a report as sort of a, a member of this target demographic saying why it probably wouldn't work and why uh, I thought people didn't use it. And he found that insight really valuable. So that is sort of how the idea for this first got started. And he started to refer to me as sort of the, the spy into the newest generation of consumers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this spying sort of evolved into collecting responses from a broader group of friends. 
And, you know, he walked by my desk one day and said, jokingly, you could make a business out of this. And the, the light kind of went off in, in the back of my mind. I've always been pretty entrepreneurial. I, I started a little art camp in lower school, and then I had a marshmallow business in middle school, and I had some drop shipping business. What did your marshmallow business do? <laughs> I made gourmet marshmallows. I was allergic, I still am, to everything. And so the idea was that marshmallows really only contain gelatin and sugar. So <laughs> I could consume them as could anyone else with lots of allergies. How is that different than uh, than Jello? Well, the texture is different, and the uh, yeah. So the... you you figured out a fluffy Jello? Is that? <laughs> I don't understand because I'm not allergic to anything. I just put everything in my body, and then my body gets <laughs> bloated, and maybe that's the problem. Maybe maybe that's the problem. You should be focusing on just gelatin and sugar. Maybe you'll, you'll okay. be a little less bloated. Yeah, you, clearly. You whip it together with cornstarch. Um, yeah, it's a it's a whole process. Huh, that's interesting. How much did you sell these marshmallows for? Oh gosh, I think they were seven dollars for a little pack of of three of them that were wrapped up in these little plastic um, sleeves. But I missed the date for the the farmers market, which mm. I needed to to submit my form to to go to it. And I thought I'd submitted it, and I hadn't. And so we ended up just running a stand in my front yard and ran the business online for a few months. But I was devastated when after the business sort of winded down, my dad didn't really love the sound of the mixers going in the kitchen all the time. Mm, I can understand that. <laughs> they were quite that. loud. Yeah. So after the business sort of winded down, I was I was devastated to go to Whole Foods and see something called Smash Mellow, which is literally my idea uh, that, it, that it worked. Mm. So that, Well, that that's a good lesson in entrepreneurship. To, Yes, it it motivates you to to go and find something else that you think might work and put in the effort to make it happen. Yeah. Okay. So, what was after the marshmallows? Would you? Do? So, post marshmallows was some e commerce drop shipping experimentation. I created this LLC called Trendy's Company, which is essentially just an umbrella company for all these different ventures I was running, and I created a bunch of Google and Facebook ads for about sixty different products and tried to use targeted advertising to to find the right customer for these products but um it's a little bit harder than you you would think <laughs> what were what were some of the products um one site was at home fitness so this was during the pandemic it was actually while i was uh interning at greenbrier i was still doing a little bit of this but uh i figured that there were lots of people at home that needed at home workout supplies so i was selling a little bit of that and i was selling some you know what a theragun is no it's should essentially I? you. You should actually, if uh, if you're ever sore or having muscle issues, they it's a handheld device that sort of pummels you until your oh, yeah. soreness goes away. Yeah, I think it was either FedSpeak or Alphaholic. I think FedSpeak on the Twitter machine was talking about this thing. Said it, it like changed his life. <laughs> yeah, there people love them. They really are supposed to help. But I was selling a a Chinese version of that um, to. American consumers and they weren't loving it because it was pretty close to the same price as a Theragun, but it wasn't a real Theragun. So mm. you live and you learn. Yeah. Brand matters. It does. It does. Did it work what you were selling or were you just hawking junk? No, it worked. Okay. It just wasn't, it didn't have the same brand name. So it yeah. didn't have the same appeal. I don't think. I understand that. It's like trying to sell a uh, Athleta versus Lululemon. It's just a little different. <laughs> It is. It certainly is. Okay, so you've you've always had this entrepreneurial bent. You go to Greenbrier. Trey's asking for uh, surveys, and the light bulb goes off. So, yes. uh, not only did uh, the way he tells the story is, you came back within like two days with a business plan. <sighs> And said to him, what do you think of this? And he gave full encouragement for uh, you to pursue the plan. Is that, a, is that an accurate representation? It was, it's pretty close to that. Um, after he left uh, my desk that day, I reached out to 10 friends from high school. And I said, hey, would you guys be interested in answering surveys if you got paid for them? And they all said, yeah. I mean, as long as it's easy and it's in a third-party app that's already on my phone. And I was like, okay. 
And so since all 10 of them said yes, I decided that I was going to make this promotional video. So I went on Upwork and I hired this guy from, um, I believe, Pakistan to make this promotional video. But I drew out all the different scenes and described them to him and um, thought that I'd been really clear. But uh, he made a, a video about a pole is happens to also be a pole on a boat um and the video <laughs> ended up being about boats so we had to to scrape <laughs> this lake clean um and start over with a different oh, that's funny guy, but it's pretty funny um, did you have to pay that person or did I, you say i did oh that's very nice of you well you know it was services that he t he technically did provide a creation of a video it just wasn't the video one I would argue there for. wasn't a meeting of the minds there therefore no contract but uh yes who yes knows? <laughs> um but eventually we did get the the video made and i showed it to trey and said you know what do you think and he said this is pretty exciting so i sent the video to those 10 friends who had initially said yes i'm down for this and said hey can you just send this to a few friends from your college that you go to and within a week, I had 200 people in the group chat. Within two weeks, I had 300 people in the group chat. Within three weeks, I had 500 people in the group chat from 70 different schools and universities around the country. And wow. at that point, I thought to myself, okay, this this could really be something because it really did. It just went viral. Where is your group chat? The group Discord? chat is within or... me, actually. Oh, so what what are you using? Are you using Slack or Discord or what? Is it just like on your iPhone, you have yeah. 700 people? Oy yeah. vey, that's a lot of things to keep up with. Okay. Yes, it, it definitely is. But they're all within one group. And we've figured out, I have a uh, this really awesome coder from Stanford who I've been working with to sort of create this software that um, allows us to use that third-party app in a way that is um, unique and sort of custom to, to what we need it for. So we can collect the data from there and it spits out our PDFs and uh, demographic information in, in a way that is useful to us. So the third party app, what is, what is that? Is that the Red Rover app? So that's GroupMe. Okay. And we've created software that works with GroupMe to sort of control our little herd of, of voters, monitor them and um, send them these surveys and then collect the results of these surveys and print out little PDFs reporting back all of the results that come out of them. So when I asked you to do a survey, I was interested in whether or not uh, your generation was open to nicotine pouches because I am interested in whether or not Altria can pivot and how Swedish Match is going to compete and whatnot. I'm looking at a 399 page PDF and I've got data on home state. Um, I've got data on political leaning. I've got data on gender age. I mean, it's very impressive how detailed all this is. Thank you. Well, so what we do is when people join the group chat, we have a process by which we message them and collect all of this information from a survey and then the information from that survey goes into a google sheet which this code that um aiden our coder has built pulls from when it's analyzing the data within GroupMe. so we use GroupMe's api to see what the answers were and then this code goes back into this public google sheet well public to the code but not public to everyone and finds the demographic information for each respondent and sort of compiles it and aligns it with the the way that people have answered the polls. So you get, you know, the answers to the poll. And then after that, who everyone was that answered that poll and who everyone was that answered a specific answer within that poll. Yeah. And do you, uh, as a sampling, so you go to Vanderbilt, um, yes. You said 70 different schools are represented as, is that as of now or is that as of when you were building it? Sorry. That was when we sure were first accurate. building it. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit bigger now. It's about 150 schools. Wow. Um, which is very exciting. Yes. That and is all exciting. 50 states are represented now, which is great. 
how um it, what I'm getting at is how do you or and if you don't now that's fine as long as people understand what's going on um yeah. are you trying to get past some sampling bias like totally. some when I when I snapshotted some of the results to the survey that we we had uh, a response to me on Twitter was I suspect these people probably skew high income and uh, I forget what states he, he had mentioned. I'll note uh, it looks like uh, 13% are from Dallas or whatever on, on at least one question, mm -hmm. or that's actually the demographic breakdown it appears. So there's some geographic um, Certainly. concentration in a way, I guess, right? Yes. Well, so the, the concentration in Texas is a natural outpouring of just me being from Texas. And a lot of the first people that joined were Texans. Um, but this, yes, you're right. It, it initially spread through college campuses. So this is an educated group of kids. We're biased towards uh, college educated or at least high school educated um, kids. And we are on a major kick to diversify our polling base beyond campuses and universities right now and also into um, the states where we need a little bit more concentration. So California is one of those, and um, I believe Oregon is another one. But the goal here is really to provide a representative sample. But the, the question comes back to you, representative is relative to the question that you're asking. So today we have bias from the perspective of someone wondering about Gen Z as a whole, since these are predominantly college kids, which, as you said, has implications about income and education. But I wonder how many of our clients are just interested in the population we do represent, which is these individuals with higher purchasing power, these more influential kids. Right now, we I, answer I bet that a question bunch. better. Probably. Um, but you know, right now, we answer that question better. And over time, we will develop the ability to answer more general questions, because that really is the goal. Yeah, or or to your point, leaning into what you have, right? I mean, that's it's um I mean, having some sort of insight into the next generation of um I hate to say it this way, but it's it's somewhat true, uh higher educated, mm -hmm. likely higher income earning uh individuals is uh I got to think a pretty interesting demographic to have insight into. Certainly. Um, and so that, that is the value that we bring right now. But for people who, you know, do want that broader Gen Z demo, that's where our, our expansion plans come into play for sure. Yeah. So um, let me ask it a different way, just sort of like as a tactic. Uh, I think it would be a tactic, not a strategy. Maybe it's strategy. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, do you think, like, how do you think about leaning into what you have versus sort of building something for everybody? Because I, I can make an argument that really leaning into this niche is a pretty smart idea. I mean, it really comes back to what our, our clients want. The, the company is built around trying to provide value to the hedge fund community and eventually hopefully to an even broader community. But right now, just to, to fund. So if this is something that our clients are interested in, more interested in than the broader demographic, then we would certainly lean into that through the, the outreach programs that we have started with colleges. It's, it's definitely easier to reach out through colleges and, and high schools than it is to try and go to your local you know convenience store and find someone who is not enrolled in college and interested in joining the chat. Um, but it would stem from the, the desires of the consumers. Yeah, that makes sense. What are some examples of some uh, surveys that you've run? Oh, gosh. You don't uh, have to use like who you ran it for, but I, I know you've done one on wine consumption. Yeah. Uh, I know you've done one on uh, nicotine pouch consumption. I know you've done one on Zen, not the nicotine pouch consumption. <laughs> but, you know, like if people are listening to this and they're thinking, boy, that's a that could be an interesting thing to add to my process. What do you totally. think uh, to date your core competencies are and kind of where have you had um, experience running surveys? Totally. Well, some of our most popular categories are streaming services, payment processors, um, just generally speaking, food delivery apps, Zoom versus Teams questions, and social media. Those are probably the largest um, 
categories of interest and recently actually alcohol um which you mentioned huh. but what about really booze cool- what do people want uh, just on on wine um actually about alcohol in general we went i think it was last week we ran one and um it was really interesting that about 50 percent of the kids prefer hard liquor over any they say mixed drinks are like their most popular i knew drink, it which is really interesting i thought it was going to be seltzer but only about 25 percent of them favored seltzer and 18 percent for beer beer's in a tough spot Mm-hmm. Have you done any for weed? We haven't actually. That oh, be I'm going to run one. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah, I'd be really interested. Uh, I wish it. I we might have to have a yearly weed one because I I have a theory on the adoption curve of marijuana, and I think it's just going to go higher and higher and higher. The um, the hard liquor, I think, is interesting because we live in this world where I think a lot of people like to say, oh, well, health and wellness is this trend. I actually think there's a trend that's unspoken among a lot of people that uh, health and wellness has this weird, um, it's almost like a, like the opposite of health and health and wellness where like people are leaning into harder and harder stuff. Interesting. Yeah. But because they're not going to get fat necessarily, they're going to go to hard liquor as opposed to boot like beer because you can drink a shitload of hard liquor and still look okay on Instagram. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's interesting you say that because we asked them, um, you know, what are your priorities when you're picking an alcohol? And one of the options was, um, drinks that get you drunker faster uh that was like one of their priorities uh for hmm. kids that were were choosing liquor yeah i i've uh i don't know i talked to some people in california and uh you know they were talking about california sober and then i dug a little deeper about what california sober means and i realized it's not necessarily healthier if that makes sense <laughs> yeah but it's not yeah um I- that's that's interesting. Okay, so we can get off vices. Uh, what about streaming <laughs> services? What did you find out about streaming services? Um, the most popular TV streaming services um, were pretty even in terms of just if whether or not people had a subscription. But then when it came down to loyalty, they differed. So the most popular ones were Amazon Prime Video, Disney Plus, HBO Max, Hulu, and Netflix. Those were all tied basically for uh how many people use them and then apple tv and espn have about half of the users that those places do and youtube tv and paramount plus were um about a quarter hmm yeah paramount plus uh mtv i i have a a sick love for mtv um (laughs) only because of the challenge shout out to johnny bananas and the rest of the ogs um <laughs> so who where was the most loyalty was it netflix it is netflix yes yeah um i mean by far when we asked people okay if you were going to give something up if you had to choose we threw spotify in there too but spotify netflix hulu and disney plus 60 percent of them said they would give up disney plus 20 percent of them said they'd give up hulu and then the other 20 percent was split between spotify and netflix really you're going to crush some Disney bulls here with that comment. Yeah, the the guy who ran the survey was pretty shocked by it too, actually. Why do you think that is? I mean, just like opining. I know you don't know, but I'm yeah, just curious. I mean, when I've talked to people about that stat, my reasoning behind it would be that there's much more content on uh, Netflix and Hulu than there is on Disney Plus when it comes to like categories. Disney Plus really is movies that are new that Disney's created or like old series that you just want to sit back and feel nostalgic about. So yeah. it's a special mood that you sort of need to be in to use that platform compared to mm. Netflix and, and Hulu. And of course, Spotify is a different animal in itself. What do you, when you sit down to watch Netflix, is that a confusing experience to you? Or do you find that to be like native to what you expect? It is totally native. Everything about it feels intuitive. And I think if you you asked any other person in this generation, they would say the same thing. 
that makes me feel old. And thank you for that answer. <laughs> um, what, what do you feel like when you look at, um, let's call it direct TV or some sort of cable legacy cable asset when you see a channel guide? What do you think? Does that feel native to you also? It does. But I think the difference there is that people grew up with different kinds of cable and they were structured like slightly differently. So accessing your favorite channels in cable is different for people depending on, you know, what their household was subscribed to when they were younger. Whereas Netflix is universally, it looks the same everywhere and everyone knows how to use it because it looks the same. So you find discovery to be like on Netflix, that is what you expect discovery to be like. I would say, yeah, the ability to search through different categories that it's displaying for you. And then in addition to that, the ability to just search for an individual show that you, you know, already know the name of and are just specifically searching for is easier than scrolling through this long list of just what's currently playing on like so a So how do you find shows? Because you said like to search for a specific show, right? So mm -hmm. part of what my um, boomer complaint about Netflix is, is I don't know when I go there what I'm looking for, right? <laughs> so sometimes I get lost in the process of searching. Yeah. So like what's your search process look like? Hmm. Well, so you're saying when you go in and you don't know what you want to watch, you have a hard time finding something? Yeah, I find myself scrolling forever and then I'm like, ah, screw it. I'll go do something else. <laughs> um, I think the recommended for you section is usually where I go first. Yeah. So that customized content, that usually hooks me. And if it doesn't, then I'll go to whatever mood I'm in. So comedy or romance or horror. I'm not a big horror girl, but if I was. Um, yeah. I would I would go there and just start scrolling through. But I don't watch Netflix alone. I think that is, is it, it's about 50-50 kids this age who watch it alone and like only use it for watching TV with friends. But I only use it when so I So when you TV say alone, friends. you mean like by yourself? Yeah, I I don't have time for it, honestly. So yeah, the so only you time are I'll running a business is... and you're in Vanderbilt. <laughs> so you, you've got other things going on and you have to party. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think that is probably the reason why it's just busyness, but since I'm only watching it with friends, it'll, it's sort of a voting endeavor. So we all sort of say huh. that one versus that one within this category. That's super interesting. I, I, I hope that we can continue to, uh, talk in the future because I'd like to know how that evolves as you get older. <laughs> I, I'll keep you updated. Yeah, please do. What what are your thoughts on? Uh, did you find anything interesting on Spotify? Media is super fascinating to me because there's so much change right now, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do people interact with it and brand loyalty and all that? I mean, what we've seen with Spotify so far, we've run quite a few polls on it, is that it is by far the most popular music streaming service, and it is really not losing ground to to anyone else. It hmm. is so popular, and the kids are so loyal to it. There was one survey that we ran that basically said if we reduce the price of Apple Music by 50%, would you switch? And the vast majority of our voters said no. Oh, Spotify Bull is going crazy right now. They love you. <laughs> Hire Alex. There you go. Red <laughs> Rover. That's awesome. That's wild. I, I um, Yeah, I feel, I, I don't know. I used, to, I used to not like Spotify that much. Uh, some of this may be because I hold the stock now, but I honestly believe the experience is much better now. They, I, I truly think from a user perspective, I don't know if Apple just like messed up their podcasts and that's what pissed me off or whatever, but <laughs> Spotify's like got me. Yeah, they have a really great way of, I think, recommending relevant content. And for my generation especially, we are we expect that of tech platforms. We expect for them to know what we like and provide it to us and make the process easy for us. Um, and Spotify does that really well with podcasts and music um, and playlists. They recommend songs. We asked kids, okay, what is so great about Spotify? And the vast majority of them said that it, they recommend songs to add to their playlists, which Apple still, it's beyond me that they don't do that. Hmm. Interesting. Do you know, do people get song recommendations 
I mean, I know they do this is such a dumb question, but I started asking it. So I'll ask it through the <laughs> Spotify, um, like through the playlist, the Friday, you know, whatever. And yeah. how like, okay, here's another, or maybe a smarter way to ask it. Uh, I'll edit out my stupid question uh, or not. <laughs> anyway, uh, do, do people care who's popular currently? Or do you think that the recommendations can create popularity. Does that make sense? This is an opinion. It's not a, I don't think you could poll on this. That's a really interesting question. I think that the recommendations, I mean, you're assuming that like Spotify recommends the same thing to every person and then they all listen to it and then it becomes popular. Is that sort of the assumption? Uh, so a while ago, um, uh, Michael Mabison wrote a book and he showed that, or he at least cited a study that said that songs that were sort of like above average were popular in, I, I might mess this up, read think twice if you think I did, uh, to the listeners, but, um, like popular songs are popular no matter what. But an average song in a social setting can be perceived as like way above average. So I'm interested in the extent that you think that like Spotify can maybe create hits out of non-hits, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think it probably could because a lot of the music that I now listen to on a regular basis has come from those recommended playlists. Yeah. And... I mean, that is partially because it knows what style of music I like. But if it's a just a pop song and it's recommending that pop song that's sort of regular to every kid that likes pop, which is most of them, then it ends up on all of their, you know, liked pages and they just shuffle their liked music every day when they're listening to music. Then it becomes something that they all know and then they play it at parties and then it becomes popular. So, yeah, I, I could see that happening. Did you do any, like, uh, did anybody ask the percentage of people that just recycle playlists versus those that are looking to Spotify recommended playlists for new songs? We didn't we ask it in that survey. exact way, but yeah, we, should, we might have to we do should a look survey. Into that. All right. Spotify bulls, reach out to me. We're going to coordinate something with Alex and we're going to, we're going to answer these questions or bears. I don't care. It doesn't have to be anybody. We just need to have some answers. <laughs> Very cool. All right. What else What else have you done that's super interesting? I could go on and on about this, but I think uh, we, <laughs> we would beat a dead horse. Like, uh, what do you well, like about being on the inside of the hedge fund question asking? Like, what's the most fascinating gosh. thing about that? It's really interesting because I ended up in this position because I was interested in the stock markets. So it's a really cool thing to have all these very thoughtful people who spend their entire day you know, researching these companies, asking questions about them that are really getting to the core of whether or not that company is going to be successful. Yeah. So that's that's what's interesting for me about it. Um, one thing that we did recently was ask about um, just podcasts in general and seeing if people listen to podcasts and watching as people's interest in and uh usage of podcasts has increased most recently we found that like 70 percent of kids listen to podcasts whereas before i think it was like 50 so i mean hmm. it really is on the rise but getting to watch those trends that have a real impact on on companies is is really cool because these when guys ask questions like like you do it sparks an idea for us to continue to ask a similar question or that same question over time and then we can build this um, timeline sort of, of, you know, a trend and show what that, the answer, how the answer to that question has changed over the past year. That's something we've done with social media, um, hmm. which I've found super inter interesting. Um, we found that it pretty consistently the, the ranking order goes Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter, and then Facebook, which literally no one uses. Um, and, TikTok actually had an increase in their sort of share of, of usership 
um, and so did Instagram. Over the past year, they went from 15% of kids saying that it was their favorite to 21%. And Instagram went from 36% to 46%. Wow. And, yeah, pretty crazy. And they stole that from Snapchat and Twitter, which went from 36% to 26% for Snapchat and 10% to 4% for Twitter. Huh. What do you yeah, think is going what do you think Instagram is doing so well? That's very interesting to hear because we are like literally on the back of a Wall Street Journal article talking about how Instagram is terrible for teenagers and whatnot. Yeah. Um so kind of interesting to hear you cite that data. Yeah, I mean, Instagram has done a really good job of, I think, diversifying the type of content they provide. They copied TikTok with Reels, and we've seen the use of Reels go up in the past few months among our voters. But they also have done a really great job of integrating advertisements into their sort of scroll. And even though people might say that they don't like advertisements, a lot of my generation actually does like these advertisements and has said that they would prefer to have ones that are customized to them and get ads for things that they actually want. So it's almost like Instagram is helping them shop while they're on social media. It's like a win-win. That's interesting. Do you, um, do you think that your generation also circling back to the Netflix idea with expects recommendations do you think your generation on average is more comfortable with sort of the quid pro quo of you're going to, you're going to know more about me, but in exchange, I expect better recommendations or better advertising. And like, do you think that you all are more comfortable with, for lack of a better term, a lack of privacy? We are, we've run surveys on it and this generation is much more comfortable with a lack of privacy than say millennials or, um, even our, our parents' generation. It's just a very different um, sort of acceptance and understanding that in order to get what we want out of the media platforms we use, which is these personalized recommendations, we have to give up some privacy. And we're, we're kind of okay with that because we've been giving it up since we were really young. And so we're, we're used to it. That's interesting. I It makes sense, but it's also, it's... Um like a little bit surprising to me in a way. So if Instagram is growing, um, like is, is Snapchat falling off? Is Twitter falling off? Like what is going on with the usage? Is it, is it just that Instagram is growing exponentially or out of, you know what, you know what I'm asking? Like, are yes. they taking share? Or are they just growing share? Is kind of the question. So if you're assuming that kids are spending the same amount of time on social media every day, as they, you know, right now, as they did a year ago, then it is stealing it from, from Snapchat and Twitter. But we ran a poll three weeks before Snap's earnings that were crazy back in July that said that 97% of our users use Snapchat. So it's not that they're not using it. It just wow. might mean that they're using it a little bit less or that they're just using social media more in general. Do you, which do you have a gut reaction on which that is? It seems to me probably using it more is the answer, but I'm not sure. I think it's just that they're using it more in general. If they are using Snapchat less, it's it's a very small amount less. They're still using it, most of our users, on a daily basis. Just checking it, checking in on people's stories. And oftentimes they don't realize how much they use it. We've run a few surveys and are continuing to, to do these on a regular basis now, which I'm really excited about, that are basically ask kids to submit screenshots of their app usage page and keeping mm. track of which categories of apps and which apps are at the top of everyone's lists and mm. trying to sort of develop a thesis around why that might be and asking our voters about the apps that they're using the most often and seeing why they use them and... Um, also keeping track of that question that you just asked, whether or not the social media use is just growing in general, or if the increase in one app's usage results in a decrease of another. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be interesting to see over time for sure. It's amazing to me that Instagram continues to grow given how ubiquitous it is at the same time. It feels like every time I'm like on a plane or whatever, the person next to me is just like scrolling through Instagram. Yeah. 
it's sometimes such a you can find Twitter debate. addicts, but they're a, they're a minority of <laughs> the population. Yeah, the I think it's interesting when you talk to adults, they assume that Twitter is much more popular among kids than it is because I think Twitter's demographic is much more millennial and just adults than it is Gen Z. And Gen Z kids honestly find the platform a little bit confusing compared to Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok. So they they definitely use it a lot less. Twitter is confusing to my generation as well. (laughs) It's just if you can get past the confusion, it becomes addictive, at least to some of us. Yeah. You know, I was talking to, I think it was maybe Trey or Josh about this idea that you are sharing thoughts on Twitter and on Instagram, you're sharing uh, images. Yeah. And so it is conducive to a more thought centered, you know, community, people who are trying to have discussions rather than show off their lives um, and photos of their lives. So yeah. that's why probably you get the younger demo for for Instagram who's trying to show off all the cool things they're doing and the pretty clothes they're wearing and, um, you know, more academic intellectual communities uh, or political arguments uh, on, on Twitter. Yeah. I, uh, I actively try not to show my life on Twitter. Interesting. Yeah. And I locked my Instagram account because I don't want people that I interact with on Twitter to see my personal life. Really? Yeah. Why? Um, because I don't mind sharing things that I don't mind sharing on Twitter, if that makes any sense. Like, I don't mind sharing thoughts. Mm-hmm. I have a personal boundary at sharing how I live and what my kids are like and uh, the stuff that I want to keep private. Interesting. I, I think the answer is when I go to Twitter... I'm trying honestly to figure out if I'm thinking correctly and I'm trying to have, if not a debate, a social conversation around the way that like my brain works and how I see the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, Instagram feels more like braggy to me and I really don't like that. Yeah. Yeah. There was a trend for a little while on social media towards like make Instagram casual again. And it's sort of, it's evolving into that a little bit more, I think, as people begin to use it more. It started off as just a, a method for people to show off their best self. And I think TikTok has sort of helped other platforms evolve into a place where maybe you're not showing your best self, you're showing a little bit more of yourself than just your best self. TikTok is generally regarded um, as a more honest social media platform, uh, where people are sort of sharing a little bit more about their private lives and like how it really is instead of just trying to make it look rosy. Whereas Hmm. Instagram is, is much more of a cultivated or like crafted image. Do you feel like you have to cultivate your Instagram image? Absolutely. That's insane to me. (laughs) I think you'll find if you talk to a lot of people in this generation, that a lot of how we find friends and determine if people are, worthy of of being our friend is looking them up on Instagram and making sure that they're like normal by way of what they have published on social media. Yeah. But then, uh, if that is truly the case and everybody is trying to create a filtered image of what they are, then like the definition of normal (laughs) becomes what's filtered. You know what I mean? Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's all become filtered, but then it becomes a measurement of how well people are able to filter and um how well they're able to create this image of themselves and a lot of time people in our generation can see through when someone has is presenting themselves differently than they are yeah you can smell out the bullshit a little bit better (laughs) a little bit yeah i mean we're spending between one and four hours on this platform a day huh so how much tv watching do y'all do and i'm gonna lump netflix in that but if you're spending Netflix that long is, on on Instagram, that's how long the older generation spent watching TV, right? Yeah, um, live TV gets barely any time, barely any. Uh, but Netflix, I believe it was most people 
they ranked their hours on a weekly basis. I want to say it was like four hours a week was like the average, Hmm. um, five hours a week. But then there, there's always the kids, you know, that are watching it two hours a day. Yeah. That makes sense. It also, Um, it seemed dependent on whether or not people were binging a series. So if they were binging, then they were watching six hours a day. And if they weren't, obviously they weren't because you can't stop binging. That's the (laughs) definition of binging. And did you notice um, that Netflix decreased the amount of time between episodes? It yeah. used to be before it auto plays. Yeah, that makes a huge difference. Spotify does it now on the pod too. Uh, I listen to the intro a lot. I'm kind of obsessed with like how this whole thing flows. Um, it's a little bit of my art project. <laughs> and I, I used to notice that when the outro would stop, the next episode, would, at first it wouldn't even auto play. Now it just like plays immediately. Huh. Obviously, yeah, people should be listening to more me, but um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know that it needs Who to be Who wouldn't want to listen to more you, Bill? Right. Uh, well, it's the guess. Um, <laughs> I got to circle back to this. It, it's surprising to me that you feel the need to, um, I guess, cultivate an Instagram image because from my perspective, uh, you're like a very attractive young lady. You've got all this stuff going on. You're an entrepreneur. You've got you've had this great in, like internship. Do you uh, like? Does the in, do you feel a sense of insecurity in Instagram that you have to cultivate, or is it just kind of like what it is? It started off, I think, as sort of an expectation that like everyone has one and you only post the best photos that you have of yourself on it but it has turned into a little bit more of an ego boost I think for people um I find that after like after weekends when I've taken a lot of great pictures or when other people have taken a lot of big pictures there will be just I mean massive amount that my feed is just chock full of people who've posted because they're trying to show off these like best moments in their lives. But I do think it does stem from insecurity and uh, people trying to sort of fill a little bit of a hole. Um, A lot of times people who like influencers who are like Instagram influencers often don't have a lot of friends in real life. Um, Hmm. There are a few that go to school here and you, they aren't in sororities or fraternities and um, you don't see them in huge groups of people. And I think that, a lot of times those people created their Instagram presence as sort of a replacement for, you know, having a a huge group of friends. Hmm. That is interesting. And it makes sense. Huh? I, I mean, Twitter does that somewhat, um, I think in a similar way, but I I do think it's a little different. Um, It is different because people aren't looking at you, I think on, on Twitter. So it's, especially for females, there's a huge focus around body image and our people. I mean, just seeing the likes roll in on a photo, you get a a adrenaline rush from people harding, you know, your face or your body. They're saying, I like the way that you appear. So I think females really get satisfaction from that. Yeah. Hmm. Well, don't let it fuck you up. That's my, that's my, (laughs) uh, recommendation. Thank you. What did you think when you were reading the Wall Street Journal stuff? About the Instagram. Yeah, like how it can negative. Yeah. Or how it can have negative impacts or whatever. I don't know if it, you know, being bad for you is fair, but. Yeah. I mean, I think this is something that like we've been talking about that. I mean, we talked about it even even in my English classes in high school of, okay, Hmm. what effect does this really have on us? So our generation, because we were the the users that used it most, I think have always been, and we were in this really crucial stage of development when we were using it, have always sort of been in conversation about, okay, what is this really doing to us? And so this isn't a new topic of conversation for for people my age. I think we understand that it is um, probably somewhat detrimental to our mental health, um, but people aren't willing to give it up because it's addictive. And um, it's become so ingrained in the way that real life works that without it, you feel lost. What do you mean uh, the way that real life works? So 
I guess an example of that would be you're a freshman in college and you are trying to figure out who your roommate's going to be and you get to pick. And so you go through the Facebook group and this is one of the only times you will ever use Facebook, by the way, Uh, (laughs) you, you will go through the Vanderbilt freshman Facebook group and you will scroll through profile pictures until you find someone that looks like you. And then you will look at that person's name and then you will look them up on Instagram and you will see if they're private or public. And if they're public, you'll probably move on. And if they're private, you'll see if you have any friends in common. Hmm. And then you will go through the friends so that they have in what common do you mean? and wait, wait, reach wait, wait, out wait. to them. Pu- wait, 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 wait. Public, you'll move on? What do you mean? Like they're not cool enough because they're not private? So there's sort of a distinction, I think, between people who are public and people who are private on Instagram because people who are private are sending the message that they have a closed social circle and therefore huh. their social circle is more desirable maybe to be a part of. Hmm. Um, smart yeah a little supply and demand but i i think that that is just one way that it can play out in life is like that, that's how you find your first friend and then once you're on campus you start requesting to follow all these people that you see around you and building this network of oh wait i saw her on instagram maybe i you know what i remember she went to the same school as my friend from uh camp I'm going to say hi to her in my econ class. Like Hmm. it's little pieces of information that you glean from just someone's bio that can help form a connection. Have you done much thinking about the metaverse? No, I really haven't. You should start thinking about the metaverse. It's, it's the hot new thing that everyone's talking about, but I I do think like fundamentally it's, I, I think where some truth in all of this is, is, the melding of online life and offline life yes. and how they're sort of coming together. Right. So it's, um, it's a very interesting concept and I don't think that we're going to get any, I, I, th- I think that the pandemic, at least for my generation, your generation probably has already been going through this, but has really like collapsed whatever difference there was between online and offline. Like, mm-hmm. A lot of us were sort of thrown onto online a lot, um, and I don't, I don't think this trend is going away. I think it's only going to get deeper and deeper. I think you're totally right, and um, having an entire like having kids that grow up with it, I think, is where it all begins. Is that they've grown up in this world where it is combined, and then they just see online and offline as the one and the same, and that's yeah. what's starting to happen. I mean, kids that are being born now. That is their perception of the world is that there's things that happen in both realms and they're both equally relevant. What did, um, what did growing up with the internet, what do you think it did? Um, I guess I have, I, I have like two questions that are like ringing out. Like, uh, you're not protected from much when the internet is all around, right? Like you can find anything. So when you had, like, I don't know, when you're 14 years old and there's no barrier to what you can find, what do you think that does to your mind or how do you treat that? Like, what was that like? I had the internet too, but it was different. It wasn't like always at your fingertips and you could find anything all the time. Yeah. I think you're, uh, there's a filter on what you use things for based on who you're surrounded by. So if you are in a gamer community, you're probably going to use the internet to watch YouTube videos of people playing video games. If you're interested in the environment, then you're probably going to use it to to look up things about the environment. People, I think, got ideas, like, from what I remember, from other people about what to use the internet for. uh, Because we didn't realize that it was so unique, I think. Like, when my parents talk about our ability to look up anything we need for a research paper within, you know, a few minutes, it's baffling to me that they weren't able to do that. So I guess I just, we didn't realize how much power we had at our fingertips. So I don't know that we were always so focused on finding ways to utilize it. It was just, Mm. if we needed something, we would, we would use it for that. And of course, you know, you do spend some time exploring or you end up in the, the YouTube rabbit hole of, you know, watching a certain type of video or TED talk, but I don't know that we necessarily 
saw it as this big open field of all the information you could possibly know in the world because we didn't know that it was special in that way. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, I, I'm terrified of what my kids will see on the internet. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's just part of the like wanting to protect them, but mm -hmm. also knowing that I can't anymore. Yeah. Like I, so I go downstairs the other day or upstairs, uh, I'm in a split level, but people don't need that detail, but whatever, you got it. <laughs> um, and, uh, like the kids are playing Roblox and I hear like a gun cock. And, you know, I got, I mean, they're young kids and yeah. I mean, I had to chew them out or whatever. Um, but the idea that that's, they can find that. Right. And it's like, um, they're so young and they're still, you know, these little beings that I look yeah, at and how could they possibly moldable. have, yeah. And like, yeah. How could they even be introduced to that? And then, you yeah. know. In the same breath, the, the maybe two days ago, they had some lockdown drill at school, uh, you know, in case a shooter yeah. comes, right? And yeah. it's like, man, there's a lot of, it feels to me, and it may not be fair, but that a lot of innocence has been taken out of life. It's an interesting point. And I think that in a lot of ways it has. One of my friend's younger siblings um, was started using TikTok at a really young age. And um, she got one of the, the problems with TikTok that people have sort of identified is that once you get on a certain type of page, it's hard to get off of it. So if you're depressed, you're going to end up watching a lot of videos of other people who are depressed. Hmm. And then you are watching videos of people who are saying they're suicidal and trying to take their lives or telling stories about how they tried to take their lives. And that's where this little girl ended up. And she ended up, she was, I think, 10 when this happened. Um, she started cutting herself. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, that's the kind of thing that you would never know about, like, as a normal 10-year-old, unless you ended up on this, this weird side of the internet that is just feeding you information like that. Oh, that's so sad. I know. Makes me want to give her a little hug. Tell her she's worth it. I know. Uh, I don't know. Well, let's try to turn this turn this away and uplifting. <laughs> uh, but I've I've enjoyed this conversation very much. Thank you for having it with me. Um, this has been great. Thank you. Yeah. For well, me. we'll continue. I just said kind of, you know, these are like very real issues, and I think that um, they're just not something that I had to deal with quite as much because I, you know, my I remember sitting in chapel. Uh, at my school when we were in like eighth grade or something and and uh they were talking about the internet and what it was going to be right and people were still on dial up and uh i don't know i used to be on the on the internet and my dad's th the phone would blink the line was busy if i was on the internet so my dad mm -hmm. would know when it when i was on it <laughs> and, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I'd try to download like a naked picture or something, and he'd be like, <laughs> he'd run into my room and catch me. It's a, it's oh, a different, uh, it's a different world it's now. It's different now. It's different. Yeah. So it's just now everything's at your fingertips. So it's, it'll be interesting to watch, you know, my children, and it's, it's interesting to talk to you about. So thank you for doing it. So uh, can you, can you talk a little bit about what your experience at Greenbrier was like, and uh, oh. you know your your introduction and or what you think about the investment community now and kind of, I don't know, where you want to take your life? Yeah, Trey speaks I mean, very highly of you. Oh, well, thank you. He, he's been an amazing mentor. And I, I mean, seriously cannot thank him enough for everything he's done to sort of help me find my way and, and help with Red Rover. I mean, just incredibly supportive mentor. But I, boy, was I lucky to have ended up at Greenbrier. I did not realize how lucky I was. Um, until that first summer uh, was probably about halfway through. But it was just such a privilege to have that exposure to this broader thinking when it comes to analyzing companies. Um, I had was probably before this very caught up in this sort of Robin Hoodish mindset of, you know, caught up trading on a new product release or headlines that day instead of searching for longer term value based on how the organization operates and how their customers really feel about their products and services. 
And um, that's what was so neat about Greenbrier is that it, it really, I really connected with their ethos of trying to find companies that do things for the customer instead of to the customer. Um, they have the saying of better, faster, cheaper, and to the delight of the customer. And I loved mm. that. So that uh, was a really, really neat way to, to think about the success of a company rather than um, the shorter term. Headlines. You know, I've been thinking about this a lot because I'm in the middle of, uh, well, I did take a big loss on Altice, but I still watch it and <laughs> whatever. But um, the, uh, the, that particular entity um, is a cable company. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I think it's hard to argue that they do better, cheaper, faster. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and then I, was talking about the Wall Street Journal with a friend and I, I hadn't looked at my bill in a while and here they're like billing me 40 bucks a month and I called them up and I was like, look, I'm not paying this. And they <laughs> dropped it to 1995 or whatever. What? So that's, I mean, that's a meaningful savings per wow. year. Yeah. Right? But that's not doing something for the customer. That's screwing the people that don't call you. Yeah. Right? That's like, okay, so my best customers that don't churn and don't bother me are going to get like screwed. Totally. And that's the business model. And when they call to con uh -huh. cancel, then we'll let them, you know, pay what we can actually charge. Oh, gosh. It builds are. resentment. It builds a lot of, you know, customer resentment. It totally does. I mean, gosh, that's that's one of the things that I think being at, at Greenbrier has helped um, prevent in Red Rover is this value uh, orientation of making sure that we are providing customers with value and not screwing anyone. And that's how I'm wired. So that's why I really connected with it is I just can't understand how someone can sit at their desk and know that they are doing a customer wrong and think that the, the in the long term, it's going to work out because when people realize that you're doing that to them, they won't want to be part of your ecosystem anymore. But it also just pains me to think that companies are, are doing that to people. I hate it. It's also, I think, uh, hard to build an organization that's excited to go to work yeah. as it as it seasons, if that's kind of the business plan, right? Like if everybody knows that they're doing something good for the customer, like here, you did a survey for me. I'm really excited to have you on the program. I know three people that have highly recommended you. We all want to help you. Trey has Thank said- you there's a good chance Alex is going to be employing all of us in the future. So be <laughs> nice to her, you know, and like um, it, it engenders goodwill, right? Whereas mm -hmm. the um, how much can I make today? Um, I don't know. There's, there's sort of an off balance sheet liability that is, that accompanies that. And I think that there are right. investments that can work if you're betting on inertia against it, but I'm going to try to pivot myself a little bit more to their philosophy. Cause I think it's a little more anti-fragile. I, I completely agree. And the, the culture and ethos of a, an organization's employees that you sort of touched on, I think is so important. One of the things that I've really loved about being able to run Red Rover while I'm in school is that I'm taking some really cool classes that I'm able to just apply in real time to the things that I do with Red Rover. And I'm taking this, organizational management class right now. And we're talking a lot about organizational theory and how these different ways of thinking about and managing a company impact uh, the output. And one of the things we're studying right now is this idea that if you get too structured and too bureaucratic and too rational with an organization, then you lose a lot uh, when it comes to what you're able to produce because it becomes too homogenous and not free enough. And that the the personhood of the people working there really matters. So the the literature backs up what you're saying. Hmm. Do you? Th I, I have to think. I mean, the thing that's ringing out in my head is what what a um, gift. And I don't mean a gift because you've worked hard to create it, but to be able to go through college and have a business and be able to apply the classes that you're learning oh and the business. Like, I bet you're learning two x what other people are, right? Because it's not just a book. You're able to implement it. No, I, I truly agree with that. And I joke that, you know, everybody should try and do this while they're in school because you really like I'm learning so much more right now than I would be if I wasn't able to apply these concepts that I'm learning. Because a lot of the time that my major feeds into consulting jobs 
And Hmm. so you don't really get to utilize the knowledge that you have learned until a few years after graduation. So this is a, it's a real privilege to be able to take the things that I'm learning and implement them in real time and see how they play out in my business, because not only does it, it benefit the business, but it allows me to really let that knowledge sink in. Yeah, I have a feeling your interview answers are going to be a little better than most people's. <laughs> Just saying. I sure hope so. I, I, sure I, hope I think so. they will. I mean, that's what experience does. It, you can't help but not. And it's uh, it's clear that you're passionate about this stuff. It's clear that you're thoughtful. Uh, it's you. it's very very cool to speak to you. I was you know slinging liquor when I was your age, <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. I made a lot of money, but uh, I don't know that. Um, you know, my takeaways were quite as good as yours. Well, um, you probably were enjoying life to yes, the fullest. Yes, I had a lot of is... current benefit. <laughs> That's worth something. That it totally yeah. is. You got no, a I'd, little balance. I'd, I'd rather have done that than nothing. Don't get me wrong. But um, <laughs> it's, it. you know, I, I learned something about turnover. I learned something about theft in cash businesses. I learned... Uh, the dangers of over pouring and inventory management. I mean, I learned stuff like that, but uh, far from a consulting gig and or, you know, building what I think could become a very, very cool business for you over the long term. And I like how you're approaching well, it. You. I think collecting this data over time is going to be really valuable. Thank you. I, I do too. I really do see that as the, the future of this. It's just being a, a way of connecting these, these kids who are, are experts in this stuff to people who maybe didn't even realize that they needed that insight. This is really valuable information that can, I think, help people make better investment decisions. And I'm hoping that the buildup of that information over time will help provide a lot of clarity um, on a lot of really hot topics right now, like tech companies and consumer brands. Yeah. Do you have, uh, do you have employees that you have hired or what, what is this? Is this yeah. uh you and a bunch of subcontractors? Are you bringing people on? What's going on? So right now it's a lot of subcontractors. Um, we have, I have two kids working for me, one that is still in college, one that just graduated. And then our, they're doing administrative and data work. And then my coder, I outsourced his work. Um, he still attends Stanford. He's my age and he's awesome. And then our website builder is outsourced through Upwork. But those are the current, I guess, employees, if you will. But we're, we're looking into a new re- referral program to sort of expand our voter base. And so I guess you could sort of say that we'd be bringing those people on board as well if we had reps at a lot of the schools we're looking at. That's cool. Do you need, like, is it, do you need anything from anyone that may be listening to this? Is there something that you're struggling with that you could ask for help? Because I do have a fairly sophisticated audience base. <laughs> well... Thank you. Yes. Um, having people ask questions to build up our, our base is hugely valuable. Um, but we are also looking into, you know, just more ambitious projects, how to go deeper into financial services, but also outside of that ecosystem. And we're looking for potentially the right strategic partner to to take us there. So we're considering a round of funding. But the the primary thing really is having people subscribe to this database or contribute to it um, in some way by commissioning some custom polls that we can add to our, our base. Where can people subscribe and uh, participate? So our website is redrovernetwork.com and you can apply for database membership there. You can order custom polls there. Um, you can contact me there. But all three of those are, are available through the website. And it's it's literally in this this top banner. And it says, order polls, apply for membership, contact us. Awesome. Well, uh, I am going to drive a couple of subscribers to you because I think a couple of my friends can use your service. And you. uh, I have greatly enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to let you get on with your day. Um, but I really appreciate it. And I hope if you're willing to do it, I'd like to have you back on you know, to kind of like give some insights into what you're seeing with the polls. Uh, I wouldn't mind if you uh, were a returning guest in the future, if you're willing to do it. Well, thank you. Yes. I uh, think there's lots of interesting things to be learned from these recurring polls and I would love to share them. 
All right. Well, cool. Well, uh, again, uh, I just, I thank you for coming on. It was a really fun conversation and I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Bill.